Welcome to the Anti-Cancer Life. My name's Taryn, and I was diagnosed with small cell neuroendocrine cancer, stage 3C. Armed with a 7% survival rate, I went on a mission to find out everything I could about what cancer is, how to beat it, and how to prevent it. On this podcast, we hear straight from cancer fighters, survivors, and experts in the field of integrative and traditional oncology. So come with me to tackle cancer, tackle health, and most importantly, tackle living. Hi, welcome to the Anti-Cancer Life, the podcast where we talk a lot about cancer. I'm your host, Taryn Hillen. If you don't know me, I was diagnosed with high-grade small cell neuroendocrine cancer, stage 3C, back in 2019. I went through surgery, chemotherapy, concurrent radiation, brachytherapy, all the fun cancer things, and I layered my treatment with complementary alternative medicine, always discussing with my doctor first, and now I share that knowledge on my socials, The Anti-Cancer Life. I am really excited about today's guest. We met in a both wonderful and terrible way. Wonderful because we got to attend a cancer camp for young adult cancer patients. We spent a week surfing in Santa Cruz, and terrible because you have to have had cancer to join this trip. Please welcome my friend, Lindsay Matthews, who is joining us all the way from Canada. Lindsay is an incredible award-winning speaker. She's currently living with incurable stage four metastatic breast cancer. As a public speaker, Lindsay leads with humor and vulnerability. She strongly believes that positivity is infectious and messages of hope are universal. Her motivation is to demonstrate to her two children that life is really good, even when it's really hard. Lindsay, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm very <laughs> So to start off, I wanted to ask, who were you before cancer? What was happening in your life? Let's see, before cancer, so that would have been before 2018 when I was diagnosed, I was a mother of two very young children. I had a two and a four year old and I was running a fitness business. So I was teaching boot camp classes, doing personal training. I was, you know, writing in a blog and essentially just building up a fitness business and trying to get in front of people, just spreading the word of health and fitness. So cancer was probably not on your mind because you're very young, as those of us with young adult cancer are. So what was that like? What kind of led up to your first diagnosis? Yeah, so exactly. And, you know, if I had a nickel every time someone said, but you're so young or but you're so healthy because I yep. was living, you know, a stereotypical lifestyle in the sense that you don't expect this kind of thing to happen. And it really did come out of nowhere. But essentially, I found the lump myself, and I had been breastfeeding my son, and I had stopped breastfeeding. And a lot of people told me, you know, sometimes your breasts will change, and they might even feel a little lumpy, and you know, here are all the remedies that you can do to take care of that. And I didn't think much of it, and I honestly didn't even feel the lump very often. Every once in a while, I would, you know, remember it was there, but it just never even occurred to me that it could have been anything nefarious. So it took me quite a long time for it to finally click that it was something I needed to get checked out. And you know, one thing I do love to share is it started to hurt. So mm. the lump area would feel very achy. And I remember the day, like yesterday, when a friend of mine said to me, well, don't worry, breast cancer doesn't hurt. And that's when this little light bulb went off in my head because I had an aunt go through breast cancer just before mm. this time and her breast cancer was found because she had pain and doctors dismissed this pain for months and months and months because breast cancer doesn't hurt. And then sure enough, I think it was something like eight months after she first brought it up, she had breast cancer. And so as soon as a friend of mine said that to me, I went, oh my goodness, it doesn't hurt, except for when it does. And I had an ultrasound the next week. Wow. Just like young people don't get cancer, exactly. except for when they do. Except for when they so, do. So it was the pain that made you finally go in. You're like, something might actually be wrong. So what was that experience? Because sometimes it takes people a long time to get diagnosed. What was that experience like? 
Yeah, so, you know, once I, it's funny, this is how not worried I was. I phoned my family doctor and I said, could I please get like a full physical? And they told me, oh, you're not due yet until the three year mark is when they do them here in Canada. And mm. I almost hung up the phone and was like, okay, I can wait six more months because my son was two and a half at this point. And that's when I was like, wait, actually, can I just come in for a breast exam? And they're like, oh yeah, of course. So I went in, my family doctor felt it and said, yep, that's worth looking into, but don't worry. It's probably just a fluid cyst. It's probably a fibroadenoma. Like, I don't think I said that word right, but the point is she was like, <laughs> don't worry. It's probably these other two things. And I had my ultrasound that week. And as soon as I had my ultrasound, they phoned me and said, you know, we need to do a biopsy. Come, you know, the next day for a mammogram, Four days later was the biopsy. They said, your appointment for the results, seven days from that. And if you need surgery, it's 21 days from then. And I was like, writing it all down. And I was like, wow, <laughs> really, you know, making sure that this is nothing. And I know they can cancel this at any point. And I was really optimistic. I'm like, you know, only 30% of biopsies turn into cancer. There's no point in worrying until it's time to worry. I really wasn't sharing this with many people. It was happening fast and I didn't want to be the person to sound the alarm, you know, especially because it was going to be nothing. And then sure enough, after the biopsy, they told me a week later it was cancer. So when you, was that a phone call or did they tell you in person? They told me in person and it actually was, you know, it's funny. I wasn't worrying because I know you hear all these things about test results taking forever and I had an appointment. And they hadn't phoned me. So I was like, well, that's okay. But then it hit mm. me the night before I started to get anxiety because I was reading about the shapes of lumps on Google. It was the first <laughs> time I Googled anything. And I was realizing in my ultrasound report, you know, things were kind of looking more like it was cancer than it wasn't. It had all the characteristics. And then I started to panic that they had not called me yet and that I was going into this appointment, possibly learning I had cancer. And in that waiting room, you know, I was starting to, you know, look at the way the receptionist looked at me and looked at the way other people looked at me. And when I went in, the nurse looked at me and said, has anyone phoned you yet? And I said, no. And that is when I knew that she was mm. about to tell me. She looked down, she looked at her notes, she took a deep breath, and then she said, I'm sorry, it's cancer. And I swore, I started to giggle, then I started to cry. And then I looked at my husband and I said, is this happening right now? Oh my gosh. And that, so it was the nurse that told you? The nurse told me. And oh, she wow. told me the way she acted before she even said the words. Yes, I, I had a similar experience where I was calling my doctor nonstop and he finally called me back at like 5 p.m. on a Friday. And I, I knew as soon as like the phone connected, you can feel that energy shift because they just kind of go, <sighs> Yeah. Like it's this deep, like, I'm sorry, I have to be the person to ruin your life right now. Exactly. Yeah. So in that doctor's office, so the nurse tells you, and then the doctor comes in, how did they explain your situation to you? You know, it was, it was a 90 minute appointment. And I remember staring at the clock, thinking to myself, my mom is going to know that something's wrong because I haven't called her yet to tell her it's nothing. Like this is going on too long. And I remember watching the clock thinking that. And they brought in surgeon. They told me, here are my options. They brought in the radiation oncologist. She told me, you know, we're probably gonna have to do radiation, but we want to do surgery first because one of your lymph nodes looks suspicious. We wanna have it removed. Sometimes doctors wanna do chemo first. And this is why we want to do it this way. But we're all meeting at a round table to discuss your case and we'll tell you in a few days what's going to happen. And I just kind of took all the information, nodded, got through it, and I was quite ready to just do everything they told me. Yeah, I'm same. It was and and I I just wanted to go back to where you said you were like giggling but then crying. My has I think that happens when I don't know if it happens to older individuals, but it's, I think it definitely happens to young cancer patients because my husband and I took it like, 
oh, what? <laughs> like, what? Is this a joke? Like, is this real life? And even the doctors were like, you guys need to take this seriously. And we're like, no, we're taking it seriously, but this is a lot of trauma happening in front of our faces right now. And I think our natural response was to sort of like giggle about it. Oh. So I want to ask you, when did you get your final diagnosis of the type of breast cancer you had? And did they explain that to you? Yeah, so you actually go into it quite blind. So they said, we're going to do, you know, the option was chosen to do a double mastectomy, the bilateral mm -hmm. mastectomy, because after, you know, I did the genetic testing, I tested negative for any of the genetic factors that are known to them right now. But they said, given, you know, my family history, because there was a little bit of family history, they said, you know, it's better to just be safe. And because of, you know, the surgery and my breast size and all these factors, they just, I wanted it gone. Like, I just, mm -hmm. I, don't worry, let's just do it. I don't need that. I'll figure it out, you know? And they said that they couldn't get the pathology of what kind of breast cancer it was, or they could not stage it until they did the surgery. So I had both of my breasts removed, and then I found out when I woke up from surgery that they had removed six lymph nodes that lit up when they, you know, put the stuff through you to see where there could have been cancer activity. Then it took about 10 days to get the results where they had tested the lymph nodes. Only one lymph node tested positive for isolated tumor cells. So that staged me at stage two breast cancer because it hadn't quite spread to the lymph nodes. It was like starting, but it wasn't enough. And that's when they said that I was HER2 positive, hormone negative, which dictated the rest of my treatment. And HER2, for everyone who doesn't know, is a very aggressive form of breast cancer. They do have a drug for it, which I'm guessing Herceptin is something that they put you on. Yeah, so HER2 positive, you know, back in the day was, you know, the worst breast cancer you could get because it loves mm -hmm. to spread. It was explained to me as it's really good at spreading and it really likes to spread fast. <laughs> and right. so I was put on Herceptin along with chemotherapy because the Herceptin targets that oncogene overexpression to try mm. to essentially disable it and stabilize it. And it really, you know, back when they first introduced this drug, it really was a miracle drug and it mm -hmm. still is. And um, I did chemotherapy for five months, which is standard, you know, breast cancer treatment. And I did the 25 sessions of radiation in that area. And I was told that I was cancer free after surgery, but the chemo, radiation, and targeted therapy was all specifically to prevent recurrence. And it brought down my chances of recurrence down the line. And you had to fight for that, correct? Because after surgery, they said, oh, we got all the cancer. And they were kind of like, washed their hands of it. And they said, you're ready to go home. But you didn't really accept that answer. That was like my first wake up call that you really need to be in charge of what's going on because my general surgeon afterwards said okay we got the margins everything's gone you're good to go and I was confused because I was like I thought I had to do chemo and radiation and I thought this was like a huge production and he said no I don't see why we got all the cancer it's gone and I went okay and I remember thinking and looking at my husband confused and I went so that's it I'm done. And he's like, yeah. I went, I'm just, I'm nervous. I was like, can you please put in the request to see whatever doctor is next? Because I really thought I had to do more. And he's like, and I remember him leaning forward and being like, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. And he typed on his computer right in front of me and said, okay, I sent that. And I went, okay. And I remember leaving the room and being like, I should be happy. He said, I'm done. I don't have to do chemo. That's huge. But I wasn't, I was like afraid to get happy. But it was right before the Christmas break, and I knew I wouldn't be seeing that doctor until the first week of January. So over that Christmas break, I slowly started to let myself feel like, okay, like, this is it. Like, I felt mm -hmm. kind of guilty that I didn't have to do any more, you know, compared to other cancer patients. I felt like I got away with something, but I slowly started to move on. I was like, I'm going back to work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And when I walked into the nurse's office at the oncology unit, I thought they were going to tell me you're done and that's it. 
So when I sat down and they started to plan chemo and radiation, I, I was panicking. Cause I'm like, sorry, the surgeon told me I was done. And they went, oh no, because, and they explained, this is why we do it. HER2 positive is very aggressive. We need to prevent recurrence down the line. And they said, what we think might've happened was the surgeon read the wrong pathology report. And I just, I cried and I was so upset. And I was more upset than I was when they told me I had cancer in the first place because this meant I'm going in for the full cancer experience now. Like this is, yeah. also, I had let myself start to move on, you yeah. know, and it was just pulled right back in only worse. So that was a really hard day. I'm so glad you told that story. And I wanted you to tell that story, obviously, because I think there's this misnomer that when you get diagnosed with cancer, all these experts are gonna come in and say, here's exactly what you need to do. Here's the exact plan and here's what's gonna happen. And, and also they tell you not to Google things. And yeah. like, cause my doctor told that to me too, because I had a rare cancer with a low prognosis rate. So it was like, don't Google it. But I'm glad I Googled it because then I knew all of the things I needed to do. And I'm glad you had looked into what you needed to do because I think the scary thing about a cancer diagnosis is there actually isn't a safety net. And there's always something that happens where you suddenly realize you're your own advocate. You have to be pushing your case forward because you are just kind of on a conveyor belt with other patients and everything is so segmented that someone isn't there to catch you to say, actually, you do need to do chemo. Imagine if you had just said, I'm, I'm not gonna do any more treatment or I'm not gonna go to that appointment or you know, believed the surgeon, it could have been a different, a different story. Exactly. It was, I was very angry. Like I remember being so angry and that's also me taking my anger out on someone, but that was when I was like, well, I guess I have to pay attention and know what's going on because I didn't want to slip through the cracks. Yes, and I think slipping through the cracks is a good way to put it because the idea that someone could misread a pathology report is scary, but it happens all the time, right? People get, I always tell people to get second opinions, especially if they have a rare cancer or their cancer might have different treatment options, get one more set of eyes on those pathology slides because you know sometimes it's an art and a science. I don't know if you've ever seen the images, but they are hard to read, they are hard to read. And so, and you expect like, oh, someone's gonna be looking at this, but really it needs to be you looking at this, like you said. Exactly. So, I, oh yeah. I have another story that's really important with my next diagnosis. When we get- Oh, there, yes, there. okay. <laughs> Just a little teaser. <laughs> There's more to the story. So yes, I do wanna get towards that. So I wanna ask you, you know, obviously this first roller coaster of cancer, um, you and I have talked about how the first roller coaster of cancer is different than the second roller coaster of cancer. So I kind of want to go to that spot where you have finished cancer treatment the first time you went to NED, no evidence of disease. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what kind of happened at that moment where did you allow yourself to say, I'm cancer free now, I'm done. What were doctors telling you? What was that sort of time period for you like of ending treatment, of ending this kind of first cancer journey? Yeah, you know, the whole time I was dealing with cancer, there was never a doubt in my mind that I would be okay because I knew that stage two breast cancer, if you do A, B, C, and D, you will get to cancer survivor status. And I was just so focused on that and I knew that. So I did the chemo, I did the targeted therapy, I did my radiation, I continued the targeted therapy and then I was done and they said, congratulations, you're cancer free, you are a cancer survivor, go, you know, like <laughs> Off you go, yeah. Was happy, but then, you know, that was difficult and I know a lot of people talk about how once treatment's over, you're kind of like, well, now what? Because you don't feel the same. Yes. but you're better now and there's this whole gap in mental health and I talked a lot mm -hmm. about it during that time and that's when I started to write more and more because it was therapeutic and I really thought it was important to share that and I just never really felt better you know I had done multiple reconstructive surgeries and there were multiple complications with those surgeries 
So, you know, that's a whole other roller coaster. But I didn't feel good. And I started to blame my breast implants after being told that I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine by I can't even count how many doctors. And I, I came across breast implant illness and I started to mm -hmm. suspect maybe my body is having a reaction to these implants, especially because after one of my surgeries, an implant became infected. And I just felt like that infection never went away. I was hospitalized. I was on these heavy duty medications, IV medications. It was a rough infection but we never removed the implant. And I felt like my body was mad and just never got over that I kept this implant even though it was infected, but then better and I was good to go. I just felt like the autoimmune response in my body was triggered. And it took me a long time because you don't wanna have unnecessary surgery. Going, right. flat is, like going flat is a whole other ball game. I, I didn't know if I could do it, you know, it's really hard. And mm -hmm. I didn't want to do more. Like I was so fatigued from all of the appointments and problems and everything. Like I just wanted to move on. And I, I was cancer free, like what more could I want? But it got to the point where I had made the decision, okay, I'm going to have my implants removed, even though all of my doctors have told me that no, don't do that. Breast implant illness isn't real. And I told- They said them, that? Oh yeah. Mo like I, all doctors said, literally <sighs> all. I found one surgeon who believed in breast implant illness and did a lot of explants. So I saw him and he told me his opinion and that it is very real and he's been doing it for 10 years and this is what he's seen. And then I found one rheumatologist. I saw two rheumatologists. I, I, got, I saw one and he said he had a patient who had similar symptoms who had her implants removed and she felt better. So there's that. And that's how he said it to me. He was like, so there's that, you know? <laughs> Just so. Like, well, you know what? That is enough for me. And at this yeah. point, I was becoming more and more desperate because I just felt like I was walking around with the flu all the time. You know, I was achy, I was unwell, like I just didn't feel good. And at the same time, my back was really hurting. You know, I had the Dorsey flap surgery where they take a part of your lap muscle and swing it around to the front because the infection had taken so much tissue. We needed wow. more tissue to um, build my chest back up. So I thought that that was like a separate complication that I was just gonna have to learn to live with. So when I had decided to have the implants removed, I called my cancer center and I said, you know, I've been having this back pain, I don't feel good, and I know that I need to have a new scan, so let's do a scan because I have an appointment with my surgeon the first week of January and I wanna tell him I'm good to go. So they book me a scan and I go in for the scan and I'm just expecting nothing and my rheumato and it's funny, it was my rheumatologist that also booked an MRI for my spine. And I, get, I do that MRI and my rheumatologist calls me and says, okay, we got your scan results back, you're good to go. And I'm like, yep, that's what I thought. And then I knew the cancer center had a separate bone scan, but I just didn't, at that point, I actually called and said, should I cancel this scan? Because my MRI was hmm. good. And they were like, no, keep it. It's, it's a different kind of test. And then on January 6th, I was doing work on my phone and my family doctor popped up and I was like, oh shoot, like I missed a family doctor appointment. That's not like me, that never happens. And then I was like, oh, she's probably calling me with the results of my MRI, but I already have them. And she doesn't realize that yet. So I answer the phone and um, you know, she said, Lindsay, I have your MRI results. And in my head, I'm like, oh yeah, see, I was right. And she, like her words were, unfortunately, there's evidence of metastatic disease on your mm -hmm. spine. And, you know, my heart stopped and I went, but they already called me and said my scan was clear. And she said, yeah, that's the thing. They've changed the report, they amended it. The first radiologist didn't see it. And when they realized what your history was, they took a second look and looked more carefully and found it. So that's the story I was saving because again- Oh my God. My report was read and finished and if it wasn't for that radiologist, for some reason, who decided to look again, I don't know how long it would have taken to find it. So I said to my doctor, you know, I was pacing. I have two kids. They were in the living room watching TV. My husband was in the basement working because he was working from home still. It was, it was during COVID time still. And I was pacing and I said, is this what I think it means? Like, this is stage four. And she said, yeah. It is. And I was just like, 
freaking out obviously because I remember the first time I had breast cancer, I was just so relieved it wasn't stage four, right. you know, because that's the one you don't want. And right. now all of a sudden she's telling me I have it. But the crazy thing is I couldn't believe it right away. I did but I knew my bone scan was scheduled for Monday. Like I knew that backup scan was coming. And I'm like, well, if they read it and said there was no cancer, then they read it and said there was cancer, there's a chance this is a mistake. So we right. decided not to tell many people, we told a few until we had that second scan so that we knew for sure before we, you know, ruined everyone's lives. Like yeah. I was, <laughs> all I could think about was how to tell everyone, you know, because yeah. that's, huge so anyways that's that well my heart dropped just when you were telling that story I want to unpack just a couple of things uh first of all breast am implant illness very real and I just want to tell people listening if they are experiencing symptoms you know go push your doctor on it I do think it's come up more in the literature maybe in the last like year or two for sure. And I think now even the FDA recognizes that yes. uh, breast implants can cause cancer, um, a certain kind of, I think it's a leukemia or it's a, it's a blood cancer. There's actually six kinds of cancer. Oh. A lot has changed in the last couple yeah. years. Yeah, and I think that, you know, I didn't have breast cancer and um, I think breast cancer patients are put in a really tough spot because that decision to do reconstruction is so difficult. I think, like you said, that idea of like, can I go flat? You know, can, can I do this? It's such a personal thing. But then this idea that we also have women, I think somewhat societal pressure too, of like kind of pushing women into this idea of, you know, you have to go through these major surgeries after you just went through all of this treatment. Um, and then we're gonna put this foreign object in your body. It just, I think breast cancer patients are in, in such a tough spot. And so I just want people who are experiencing symptoms to know that, you know, breast implant illness is a thing. And if you are to go get it checked out. And then I want to ask you, what was your, you know, like you said, you were relieved the first time because you weren't stage four. Yeah. I had the same feeling when I first went in, they thought I was stage one. And so I kind of had a slightly, I, well, I mean, I guess it was similar. They thought I was stage one because my tumor was so small and um, and the PET scans and everything only showed local disease right before the surgery, but it was after pathology came back that I was stage three C. That was devastating to me and I guess probably the same as you my first thought though was oh well at least it's not stage four i think a lot of us do that at least it's not stage four for certain types of cancers for sure. stage four for other cancers is completely curable um so what was that you're now living the thing that you were basically afraid of we all live with this recurrence like hanging over our heads and now that moment is happening to you, like what was your mental state? How did you decide you were gonna tell people? Were you gonna do this roller coaster differently than you did it the first time? Yeah, it was a totally different experience. And what's crazy is I had to learn exactly why I was so afraid of stage four. Like I knew it was bad, but I didn't really know why. It wasn't ever made clear to me. I guess you only know what you need to know at that time, but um, the reason why stage four breast cancer specifically is so devastating is because it's very sneaky and it's very smart and it mutates and it finds ways to survive and evade treatment. And scientists don't know why. You know, they don't know why some women will be cancer free for the rest of their life and they don't know why almost a third of women with early stage breast cancers end up stage four at some point in their lives. Sometimes a year later, like me, I was a year and a half later, and sometimes 15 years later. Like, no one knows why, and it just, it blows my mind that in mm -hmm. this day and age that there's a huge chunk of this puzzle still missing. And so I figured out how hard it is to treat breast cancer and how eventually it will learn to live with treatment, and that's why women have to change treatment and that's why they run out of options at the end of the day. And it was dark, you know, the very beginning of it was adrenaline and I was very positive. I was like, okay, well, lots of women live to be 
very they, lots of women live with this disease for a very long time i'm talking mm -hmm. 15 years 20 years 10 years um statistics aren't good but if anyone's gonna do it it's me and right. i'm gonna find the reason in this and i'm gonna be that person to beat the odds and here i go and all those things and it was a few weeks in when it's almost like i just kept getting beat down with bad news and it just kept coming and it just kept getting harder and that's when i started to experience you know anxiety and depression for the first time and you know telling my husband was awful and it makes me emotional just thinking about it and then telling my kids was worse the you know the good thing when you tell children is they were upset of course but they really don't fully understand you know whereas my husband mm -hmm. does fully understand um and that you know i could get into that but telling my parents you know, telling my best friends, telling the world eventually, weeks and weeks later, every time I had to do it, it was devastating. You know, I felt like I was breaking everyone's hearts because I was, and it's a compliment and it's wonderful to have so much support, but at the same time, it's devastating to be responsible for so much pain. And this was my new reality. Like this was, this is going to be the rest of my life is living with this disease and grief of what's coming. And it's honestly, it's the weirdest, it's the weirdest thing. You know? And I, I was just explaining to a friend earlier today, I'm like, I am living a really weird life. Like this is just nuts. Cause I feel so normal and I'm just like a normal person but I have this dark cloud following me around and I'm like, is that my cloud? Like, is that mine over there? Is that? Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't make sense. And, you know, I cry every single day because the grief hits me every single day for different reasons. And then I'm, and then I get on with my day and I just have very normal problems and I'm annoyed by normal things. And it's just, it's just such a weird in between reality. Yeah. I think, that uh, a lot of obviously a lot of people feel that way and it is strange how normal your life still is obviously you're dealing with all of these heavy things like you said that dark cloud following you around i remember standing at a starbucks uh, on a way to a brain mri for them to check if it was uh had uh gone to my brain and and i just remember like being like am i just ordering coffee right now and i'm like watching you know, and I think that was the first time too, someone had sent me a PubMed paper that had a prognosis rate for my cancer on it, which was 7%. And I, and I was like in the Starbucks, like they're all just getting breakfast sandwiches and coffee and I'm getting a coffee, but like this other really serious, terrible thing is also happening. And I feel like you're still, I think people are surprised. That it's like, you don't just like go away. Like you still have a life to live. I know you're, you know, very committed to like continue living and you're planning all these things and, and yet you still have to juggle this diagnosis. Um, are there, I know you and I have talked about things people say to you when you tell them about this diagnosis. And I was wondering if you just wanted to share some of the things you maybe wish people wouldn't say to you. Yeah. You know, I recognize that it's a really hard thing to respond to. And I, it's amazing. I've never had to give people bad news more than once. Like, it's just so overwhelming when all of a sudden you're like, I have to do this again. And it's much worse. And <laughs> well, the first time it was like, don't worry, it's going to be okay. You know, people would get upset. And then, you know, I would make sure they knew it's going to be fine because it was. And I really believe that second time around, I find you know, a lot of people are telling me, don't worry, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and all I can think of is like, no, it's not. That's what I'm saying here. And of course, everyone is coming from a good place. And I understand that wholeheartedly. However, it, it almost makes it difficult because you feel a little bit dismissed, you know, and I don't want to ruin people's lives because it's like, well, how hard and honest do I need to be? And I do find myself deciding how honest I am with people just because 
I don't want to, there's no point in making it sound terrible if I don't necessarily need to. And even though that's what I'm feeling, but you know, I was making a joke about how different people respond in different ways. And I'm starting to learn the style in which people receive bad news. You know, some people cry, some people make jokes, some people avoid my eyes. Some people don't text me back. You know, some people shower me with presents. Every <laughs> person to take my kids, every single person. I will watch the kids. And I'm like, that's the one thing I don't want, but thank you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I wanna hang out with my kids. <laughs> not enough people offer to clean my house. I don't know what's up with that. But like, hello. Anyways. Hear that? Offer to clean her house, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the first time when I had the stage four diagnosis and I was going through it, you know, I had to jump into chemotherapy immediately. Um, I did radiation on my spine on some of the larger tumors and I got right back into the Herceptin, the drug we talked about before. And um, they, add, they added two more targeted therapies on top of it. So that is my current maintenance routine. I finished chemo a year ago. I haven't had to do radiation for a year and I'm just doing those targeted therapies, and so far I am stable. So I feel like that's something I should have mentioned early on. Right now I'm stable, and I'm in the zone of normalcy. And of course I am living with symptoms, and sometimes like cancer treatment actually made, for example, my back pain worse, because now I'm left with, you know, injured spinal cord, but, right. you know, that's what happens with cancer, and it's better than cancer taking over, but I'm learning to live with it, and I'm happy, and I'm good. And I'm terrified. I am absolutely right. terrified. I'm under surveillance and I get scans constantly. And I'm just one scan away of everything changing again. You know, and it's it's difficult to live with that. I'm learning though, because I'm starting to get used to it, and you don't think you'll get used to it. Um so yeah, it's like I have some really amazing people in my life and uh, there's enough people where I can be very honest, although it's hard. And I'm just really grateful for that. I want to talk about how, uh, what you were kind of what you were talking about before of telling people the bad news. And I think there's that onus of like, you end up consoling people when you're giving them the bad news about this thing that has happened to you. And I know for me, it was also difficult. I constantly was I didn't want to be negative I wanted to be the person yeah. that was like no I've got it it's going to be fine but then when people brush it off too much then you feel like it's on you to be like well actually it is quite serious <laughs> you know let me let me just jump in there a little bit and tell you how serious it is and and I think that's a lot of pressure to put on cancer patients to they then have to explain how bad their diagnosis is even if you are the most hopeful most optimistic most inspirational person you still feel this need to say, well, wait, hold on, this is quite serious. And I know one thing people used to say to me all the time is, well, we could all get hit by a car tomorrow. And I know you have a great analogy about this, and I was wondering if you would share that analogy with us, because I think it's really important for people to hear. Yeah, you know, it was, it's a funny reaction, and I do understand it, but I also wish it wasn't a reaction. But I have, you know, I would share the news and sometimes I would explain a little bit about what that means. And then, you know, people like think, well, any one of us could die tomorrow. Any right. one of us could get hit by a bus tomorrow. And I'm just like, yeah, like that's true. Anyone could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Um, but I like to use the analogy where I'm like, but I'm gonna get hit by a bus. Like I know there's a bus coming. And just this past April, I got to participate in a inspirational speaking competition. It's called Speaker Slam. And, you know, inspirational speaking, public speaking, it's something that I've always really loved doing. And when this competition dropped in my lap, you know, by a chance meeting with the founder, one of the co-founders of this company, I took it and the theme was against all odds. And it was just perfect for me. And I'm like, this is a sign. And writing a five and a half minute speech when you have all of these stories and experiences <laughs> is impossible, first of all. Yeah. And I decided to just jump right into that analogy and just explain, you know, it's, it's the best way to explain to people what it is. You know, anyone can get hit by a bus. That's what people say. 
very nonchalantly. But the difference is I'm on the road and there's no room for me on the sidewalk anymore. And I went further to say, you know, my family is on the sidewalk. My husband's with me, but he's on the sidewalk. And my kids don't even know that I'm on the road. Like they don't understand that there's no room for me on that sidewalk. And you know, the bus is coming and I can see it. And all I know is for sure, I'm gonna get hit by a bus. And there are some things that will slow it down. And some women are luckier than others. And there's really no, there's no explanation as to why some women defy odds so well and why some don't. And that's also, you know, one of the really scary parts is you don't know which statistic you're going to be. You know, right. all of I will be a statistic. So when people say things like that, it just kind of diminishes what you're going through. And it also, it just means that they don't really understand. And like you said, you don't want to be the one to be like, no, listen to me. It's, really, <laughs> yeah. really, it's really bad. bad. Yeah. It's so yeah. much worse than you think. Like, let me ruin your life. <laughs> yeah. Let me, let me just tell you how bad it is. <laughs> don't you know how bad it is? Like, you don't want to be that person. Um, but I think, and you know, if anyone's listening to this and they're, they're thinking, well, then what do I say? Cause what do you say? And the answer is yeah. there really is nothing to say. And sometimes just listening and just mm-hmm. saying, I have no idea what to say right now. That's the most honest, like supportive thing you can say. And yeah. we don't know how to have this diagnosis either. You know, we don't know how to be supported. I don't know what I need. Right. So it was... It was a really good analogy. Like it really, I think it really hit home for a lot of people. It hit home for me. I went and watched your speech and for anyone listening, you should definitely go watch her speech on YouTube um, or your website. When I listened to it, when you did that bus analogy, like I felt like I had a light bulb moment because so many people had said, it was always a car for me. You could get hit by a car tomorrow. Um, But when you said that of, I can see my bus, I was like, yeah, that's, what it feels like, you know? And that just was really inspiring to me. And I was like, she just put into words, like in a simple sentence, everything I had had been feeling for so long. And so I appreciate, not to fangirl out on you, (laughs) I appreciate you, um, you know, sharing your story and you could be spending your time in a lot of ways right now. And the fact that you're helping other people and communicating your story and helping other cancer patients, I think that's, I think that's really amazing. Um, I wanted to ask you, and I want to get the quote, and I thought I wrote it down, but you had written something um, on one of your blogs, and I wanted to ask you about it, and now I'm scrolling to find, oh yeah, you wrote that being sent to palliative care clinic is a whole other vibe. And I wanted to ask you, it seemed like in that sentence, the fact that you were using vibe, that there was something going on there. And I wanted to ask you what that vibe was, if, if you're okay answering that question. Yeah, you know, that blog, I think it was the hospice pamphlet. Um, mm-hmm. That was a turning point for me. That was like that storm cloud where I'm like, are you sure that's for me? <laughs> yeah. What's crazy is my oncologist, my primary oncologist said, you know, Lindsay, we're gonna send you to this doctor at this clinic. And she called it, I swear to God, like my memory is pain management clinic. She said, Mm -hmm. they're gonna be the ones on top of your medication. They're gonna be watching your painkillers, you know, helping you with symptoms. And they're the ones who are gonna help you. And, you know, I'm doing this part of treatment. That doctor's doing that part of treatment. They're doing your meds. So I put in my calendar pain management clinic and that was it. And I arrived and I will be honest right now. I did not know what palliative care meant. Like I did not know that word. I've seen it. I just never, it didn't hit me. I didn't know what it meant until I saw it and I just didn't absorb it. So when I had my very first appointment at the pain management clinic, um, I was shocked at the questions the nurse was asking me and the stories she was telling me. And it quickly got dark like in my head and in my stomach and in my chest, like, you know, one of the first things she said to me was, oh, well, don't worry, breast cancer these days. I have a friend who's had, she she survived eight years, don't worry. And I was like, what is happening right now? Like, is that supposed to make me feel better? Eight years is not very long. 
And then yeah. I learned that she had a breast cancer that was much less aggressive. So I'm like, that doesn't help me at all. And I, in the appointment, they're going through my medications and they're going to help me. And then it was explained to me that they're the ones who make you comfortable through end of life. And I just remember thinking, what? Like, I'm really young and I'm fine. And I'm, I have barely even started treatment and what's happening. Like I was just very upset, so confused. I was by myself because I did not think I needed an emotional support human being with me. And so when they said, do you have any questions? I said, actually, you know, do you guys have any suggestions for therapists or something for my kids? I want to make sure my kids are supported. Cancer is a big part of their life. And I just want to make sure I'm doing everything I can to make sure they're coping. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, don't worry. We'll give you some info on the way out. And I was like, cool. So we get through my appointment and you know, I'm just trying to get out of there. And they were like, and I reminded them, you said you had some information. They're like, oh yeah, I'll grab it. Just come walk with me. So I walk down the hallway with them. They go in their office, they come out. She hands me a hospice pamphlet. So I mm. look at it and like my chest, you know, it's like a lightning bolt inside my chest. And she starts circling all this information that I should look into. And then she gets to the back and she's like, you know, these are the programs for kids like yours. They do this and that, you know, giving me details. And I'm like, kids like what? And then I was like, what? Like, anyways, <laughs> I, can't, I can't even say it out loud. You know, it's kids for parents like me. And I was very upset and shocked and angry. I had never been so angry. And, you know, I wrote about, you know, that trip home. And now I have to clear my head because I'm about to walk into my house where my kids are going to greet me. Anyways, I threw out that hospice pamphlet. <laughs> yeah, you're like, this is going in the trash. It's in the garbage. And I just remember thinking I was like ambushed. Like, that's what it felt like. No one really warned me what any of that meant. And I had no idea that that was the protocol. Like, that they yeah. would send me to a palliative care clinic before I even knew really what I was dealing with. So that's that. And that was <laughs> when the depression started. Like, that was when I started to feel hopeless and distant and that was a whole new world for me so do you think that you wish that that doctor who had originally sent you to that pain management clinic that they had offered some kind of support or resources or anything to sort of prep you for that situation because i think going alone there to learn about palliative care, that in itself can be really trauma-inducing. Yeah, and to be honest, it's almost like I was right back in that appointment where I learned that I had to do chemo again. I felt taken back and surprised that this was happening and I had to go through all of these emotions again and on my own with no warning. I recognize that doctors are overworked and busy and there's a process and a protocol and all she was doing was the next step, which was now you're going to be taken care of over here. And they are managing my pain. That is what they do. They are the ones watching all my symptoms and helping me. But um, they probably just made the assumption that I knew what it was or that I understood what was happening. and maybe it would have been nice if they did not make any assumptions and yeah. you know really just took a minute to say are you ready for this part or we have to send you here but don't worry it's just because of this like I just there for sure could have been a different way to handle it but I recognize why it wasn't handled different and maybe I should have googled it it's like the one thing <laughs> I did not google something before I went so it's on me yeah, I love that you just showed it. You're like, I'm here for pain management. And they're like, yeah. let us let us ruin your life even more right now. Yeah, it was shocking. Um, I just want to, because I want to be respectful of your time. And I just appreciate you telling all of these stories. And I know everyone listening appreciates it. But I do want to ask you on, I guess, like a more positive note. How, what is the next like one to five to eight years looking like for you? I know you're planning a lot of things. What What is your mindset kind of going into it? And I know at FD, you had mentioned, I've got a lot of living left to do. And so I'm just curious about how you're feeling about the next couple of years on the horizon. You know, what's funny about me before cancer was I was always a jam pack as much life into this life as you possibly can. Like that is, that's been my personality forever. 
you know, much to my husband's dismay. Like he would always have to reel me in, slow it down. <laughs> He'd be like three things at a time. Cause I'm just trying to do everything all at once and say yes to everything. So that hasn't changed. However, I'm definitely much more intentional with how I spend my time. So instead of saying yes to absolutely everything, I'm saying yes to the things that make sense and that matter more. I am prioritizing more and I'm not trying not to spread myself too thin. Having stage four breast cancer is a full-time job. Like I swear the appointments are never ending. It's shocking to me. Like I'm stable right now and I'm constantly in appointments for different things, plus appointments to help, you know, like manual appointments, like physiotherapy and osteopathy and all those types of things. And right now I live, you know, day by day, but at the same time, I would say I'm pretty much living one year in advance. So we have, you know, a trip planned and that's what I'm focused on. I know that treatment could start back up any given day because I do have scans often enough, including a scan this week. Like mm -hmm. this conversation could literally be airing and I could be back in treatment. Like that's how fast things change. But as much as I grieve every single day that this could go terribly wrong at any point, and that's just like the weirdest thing to know, I also have hope that that's not gonna be me. Like I really do have this like weird blind hope that I'm gonna be able to live like this for like a really, really long time. Like I just can't imagine different. It's just weird. And you know, a lot of people will say, you know, would you, if you had a crystal ball, would you wanna know when your life ends or how it ends or what happens? And that's a tough question for people to answer. People are always like, mm -hmm. hmm, want to know what I not want to know like what's better and I think I've decided it is better to know as hard as it is because although it's challenging and you have to really work on your mental health and I do work on my mental health like I'm, I'm really you know into meditation I do things that I know are good for me I recognize when the depression starts to get heavier I'm dealing with anxiety um at the same time, it allows me to make sure that I'm being very intentional with my time and I'm being present. You know, like my parenting, for example, with my children is forever changed. And mm -hmm. I know that my situation is changing the way some of my friends parent. And, you know, I'm so grateful that my situation is touching others. And when people tell me, Lindsay, I think about you when this happens, and I think about you when this happens, and honestly, that's a huge compliment. And I love that what I'm going through can do good in other families as well, because our family, you know, is my top priority, and we live a really intentional family life right now. So I'm glad that I'm not wasting my time and energy on things that really don't matter. You know, you just, you see yeah. the world through different lenses and the perspective is just a gift, you yeah. know, and I, I, and I really want to spread that. I would love to share that with people because you can't be in this situation and not look at the world differently. And with so much empathy, you know, and non-judgment, it's like, it's crazy. Like I used to dwell and worry about every little thing, you know, how the world was around me, how people thought of me. And I'm really learning, it's not perfect, but I'm really learning to let that go because yeah. there's just no time for it anymore, you know? Yeah, well, I think you're doing a great job spreading that message, you know, just through your public speaking and just who you are as a person. I told you this when we met that like, I, people can't tell maybe through the video screen or through the podcast, but you have like such an incredibly warm, infectious energy. I, I do think that, you know, people rise to the challenges that they're given. And I think you're rising in just an incredible way and sharing your message with the world. And I appreciate you taking the time to do it today. Um, and I wanna be respectful of your time. Is there anything else you wanna say or do you think no. you, I feel like we could talk for hours, but. <laughs> you definitely could. Um, maybe the only thing I wanna say is if, if anyone's listening to this and 
something resonates with them or they have questions or similar stories or anything, I love talking to people who want to know more or who feel very alone in their circumstances. I, I love it when people reach out to me. Like if anyone has questions about anything that I've talked about, like I know that my information will be linked somehow to this podcast. Like I'm inviting anyone to reach out to me. Like I, it's therapeutic for me, you know, to get into it at the same time, yeah. but I really do find purpose in helping others. And when I hear stories of, you know, the changes people have made in their lives because of something I've said or shared, it encourages me to keep doing it. So I really appreciate that. Will you plug, because I'm gonna link everything on the YouTube video, but will you plug your socials right now if people are just listening in the car or on their sure. podcast? Like how can they find you on Instagram, TikTok, wherever? Sure. My, my handle for almost everything is just my first and last name, which is Lindsay Matthews. Now my first name is L-I-N-D-S-Y. It's different, <laughs> everyone else. Um, so it's at Lindsay Matthews, Lindsay Matthews, Lindsay Matthews.com, like all those things. So that's where you'll find me. And you can also Google my name spelt correctly. And all of these things will come up too. <laughs> so funny. When I first saw your name, I thought, oh, did she just do that for her socials? Everyone thinks that. Everyone. <laughs> the government tries to correct my name every yeah. year. It's hilarious. <laughs> They're like, you spelled your name wrong. You're like, I, I actually didn't. I know how to spell my own name. Well, yeah. Lindsay with a DSY. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And hopefully we'll have you, hopefully you had a good experience. We'll have you back. Cause I feel like we could talk about a ton of things like breast implant illness. We could talk about how doctors often don't take our, uh, us seriously problems in our medical system. There's a lot of cancer topics we could go over. So again, I really appreciate you having you on. And if you're watching on YouTube, I'm going to have a bunch of links down there um, for you to follow Lindsay. So thank you. Thank you so much. This was very fun. I really appreciate it. And we'll definitely do this again. Okay. Bye. See ya.